ancestors of long ago lived in a very different concept of the world than the one that we know today. Perhaps the greatest difference was in the universal recognition that reality was spiritual, not material. That all physical and material things were suspended from spiritual causes. A man searching for these causes instinctively turned his attention to what he regarded as the superior parts of the world. Ancient man had already come to a very important decision concerning the mystery of life. He assumed it to abide in the furthermost parts of the world and the innermost parts of himself. To him and to those who came after him, the term heaven came to have a double meaning. It was not only the spiritual abode of the blessed dead, the home of the gods, and the dwelling place of beings that never became visible to our perception. Heaven was also the great diffusion of space. This tremendous vaulted mystery that seemed to enclose the world as man knew it. Therefore, when he referred to terms such as heaven and earth, he could have more than one meaning. Heaven could be the starry firmament and all that lay beyond it. The earth could not only be the planet upon which we live, but matter wherever diffused or distributed through the sidereal forms of things. Thus in antiquity the world does not correspond either with the solar system or the cosmic system or the planet itself. The world is a state of being. And for particular purposes, the ancient regarded the world as the material state of being. He extended it outward, not only to the orbits of the planets, but out into space, into all the hypothetical physical forms that might exist anywhere in the great material diffusion of, of matter and substance and of elements and essences. He then gradually came to conclude that there were three kinds of energies operating in all created things. The first was direct energy, which he associated with the sun, or with perhaps more correctly, the great spiritual source of the solar light. The second was reflective energy, which he sensed as being turned from the surfaces of the planetary bodies, shining not with their own lights, but with the lights of the heavens. And a third kind of energy, which he called material energy, which emanated from the earth itself, and was a kind of physical kind of energy. Thus he had two, uh, three energies, spiritual, psychic, material. And he called the lowest of material energy force. And he considered force to be the dominant factor in the mold moving and molding of matter. He considered reflective energy, or that from the planets, as formal, or relating to the principle of form. And therefore, that all compound natures, which are forms, are sustained by planetary energy. He then assumed that the spiritual light and power at the root of things, consciousness, essence, life per se, came from a further kind of energy which he regarded as solar, or belonging to the pure light of a sun. He then populated the firmament with suns, declaring that they were scattered like flowers throughout the great field of the sky and that all these blazing suns together constituted the collective spiritual energy which sustained creation. These suns were what he called in those days, particularly the Chaldeans, the father fountains of all things. 
For these sons were like vast springs rising in the fields of eternity and watering with their life all of the structures which we call created or creation. Thus from the beginning he had a very spiritual concept of the universe in which he lived. All causes came from the great spiritual sources of life. He did not fully understand these sources, nor was he perhaps equipped to analyze uh, the astronomical mystery of the cosmos. But he did live under the strong conviction that the sky that enfolded him was the source of a life which came from divine beings, and that the heavens were populated with a race of gods, and that the shining eyes of these gods watched him at all times, and they spread the mantles of their starry forms over the whole of creation. Uh, thus religion inevitably borrowed much of its coloring from these spiritual ideals. Today we hold a somewhat contrary viewpoint. We build upward from matter. We assume our own material state to be a kind of center from which we seek to expand or spread out into space. Perhaps some do hope to find in space the answers to the mysteries of existence. But we are groping out towards spirit, whereas our ancient forebears lived forever in the acceptance of spirit. They lived forever in the realization that their little life was rounded by a vast spiritual scheme or plan. It was natural that the ancients, possessing as they did so strong and powerful an interest in philosophy, should have gradually organized the primitive opinions and convictions that had arisen in human experience. Mm. Thus, by degrees, theories were developed, concepts were formulated to explain the great mysteries of space. These explanations were not essentially very different from our own. We use more scientific terminology, and we have certain calculations to support our opinions. But ancient man did not differ so much from us in conclusions as we might immediately suppose. We assume that he must have been ignorant in comparison to what we know. But as we have said in other talks, Primitive man seems to have possessed an intuitive power to grasp at realities. He lacked the words, he lacked the convenient terms and idioms with which to express what he had discovered or what he had felt or known. At the same time, he has left us, perhaps crudely but effectively, the record of his contemplations. So astrotheology must include this understanding of space of the worlds, of creation, and of the laws governing all of these things. Perhaps one of the uh, most complete expositions of this that we have will be found in the religions of ancient India. Here we find astronomer Brahmins, students of space and time, working <coughs> with the great foundations of knowledge even as we labor today. These ancient Brahmins not only possess unusual intellectual powers, but a tremendous daring of spirit, which enabled them to evolve and perfect concepts that almost overwhelm us even today. Their estimate, for example, of the length of life of the solar system uh, was so mathematically amazing mm but we do not yet dare to believe it, yet we have never proved it to be untrue. All of these extensions, mathematical, scientific, rational, resulted in the gradual integration of a great concept of macrocosm-microcosm analogies, analogies of the operations of laws on different levels, and the gradual extension or expansion of the things that we know out into the great vistas of the unknown, seeking to conquer that which is beyond our sensory 
perceptions with the pure strength of our reasoning and intuitional faculties. So we have some interesting points which they made, which come within the province of our present thinking, and so we will attempt uh, to expound at least some phases of their beliefs on these matters. To the ancient Brahman, to the ancient Hindu scholar, space was first of all a totality, a unity. It was not an absolute diffusion going on forever and ever. It was a totality without boundaries, as far as we can conceive boundary. It was an allness that was also a oneness. For space, to these ancient people, was the ultimate answer. It was the only recourse of the mind or of the reasoning power in attempting to analyze an existence as we know it. All lines of research, all endeavor, all contemplation, moving from the familiar outward to the unfamiliar, passes gradually into a rarefied atmosphere in which mind and contemplation seem to fail. There is somewhere out there a point or a condition in which the conceivable fades into the inconceivable, the knowable into the unknowable. That which has an existence in time retires into an eternity. And in this great collective concept of ultimates, ancient man established his definition of space. Space was ultimate. <clears throat> space was unconditioned or it preceded condition. It was ultimately again unconditioned because it extended beyond condition. All things that exist arise in space and vanish into it again. Thus space, and all that it represents symbolically, is the eternal. It is that which has neither beginning nor end. It has no upper nor lower parts. It has no superior or inferior members. It goes on forever. Every part of itself full of life, every part of itself germinal and seminal, every part of itself capable of releasing beings from itself. It is a completely rich, inconceivable kind of earth, an invisible earth in which everything grows, and everything has its tap roots in space. For from this one eternal condition, all other conditions must come. Thus this, in, this uncondition cannot be vacuum, cannot even be continuum as we know it. It must be total fullness. Space must be the most complete of all things. There can be no lack anywhere within it, no strange bubbles in which itself is, uh, it is empty. It cannot contain or consist in vacuum. It is total fullness, total allness. And it is therefore also and continuously the source of every conditioned existence. The space and the great field of the sky came symbolically to be associated. Space, however, was more than sky, because we must realize that the ancient did not have a material space. He did not know of space as merely the extension of matter. To him, space was essentially a spiritual fullness. But in his scientific thinking, he was not content merely to use a platitudinous definition of spirit. To him, spirit was not a theological thing. Spirit was actually a condition, an, an endless, eternal fullness of all things. Spirit was life, total life. Life capable of producing an infinite diversity of lives, but of itself, one. Space was an absolute nutrition. Space nourished everything. All things directly or indirectly are fed from space. Because everything that supports life is in turn supported by space. The space is the ever-providing. Space is the ever-benevolent parent. The 
the space spreads itself and diffuses itself so that it is everywhere. There is space between every dancing atom. There is space between all cells. There are spaces between planets. But these spaces are not emptiness. They are bridges of fullness, binding things together. Space also contains within itself the roots of the binding and loosing. It does act as an eternal agent of binding. Nothing can escape from it. And in some way, beneath its invisible and apparently completely flexible azonic constitution, there is something that is fixed, something that is firm beyond all firmness, strong beyond all strength, and enduring beyond all endurance. The space carries within it foundation, place, and in its own mysterious way, moving upon itself, it engenders time. For time is an unfolding, a moving of duration in space. And on and on and on, these calculations, these reflections, these meditations go. Until ultimately, the ancient world regarded space as the final God, the absolute deity. Absolute because no one could find any way of discovering the finite within it. It maintained all finite things. They were parts of it. But it was totality, and the only totality. And everything that exists, when mingled with everything else that exists, exists. These sums together can only equal space. So space is not only the place in which all things are, it is the substance from which all things come. And within it move the laws and principles by which all things are guided and directed. And in space we have great foundations, not only of energy, of time, and of duration, of extension and dimension. We have within it also the great orders of organization. Space is totally archetypal. It contains within itself an infinite diversity of patterns, for it contains every conceivable form, every conceivable structure, every conceivable radiation or pattern or design that can exist anywhere. All the different forms of flower and fauna, all these are forms which have their roots in space. Therefore, space is formal also, for it contains the right of all things to have form, and it bestows form according to law. Somewhere also among, this, among these infinite diffusions of space lurk the principles of universal law and order. Here were the great patterns, not only of form and of structure, but of moral, of ethics, of all cultures and art. All of the discoveries that man can ever make on any level or any plane must first exist somewhere in the infinite fullness of space. It was quite conceivable, therefore, that this term space had far more meaning than we give to it today. It became a symbol of the totality of life, the total and complete sufficiency of this source from which all things gain not only their right to exist, but the very elements and essences of their existence. Now this space was populated with a concatenation or order of powers. And this order of powers extended beyond any dimension that we can conceive. For just as surely as there is an infinite number of living things upon this earth, so there is an infinite number multiplied by itself of things existing in space. And in space we find the race of the giants, the race of the great divine heroes, the gods who are over worlds and over creations. And the ancient struggling with his concepts, seeking to determine the way in which all these things operated, came upon a mysterious pattern of septenaries, Everything evolved or developed in terms of sevens. 
And therefore, in the very dawn of things, a septenary of powers, representing the seven primary attributes that man was able to experience concerning universal energy. These attributes, as emanations or as emergencies, flowed out of space. They were the primary archetypal form generated within space. Now by what means and under what conditions are we to assume that space, moving endlessly in its own nature and substance, should pass through alternations of objectivity and subjectivity? The ancient observing everything else in space assumed likewise that motion was there. Motion originated in a movement of space. Motion existed in two forms or of two kinds. Motion in suspension and motion in action. Space in its own substance was infinite motion in suspension. Space contained the potential of all movement because it possessed all direction. But this movement passed through alternate periods of action and inaction. An immense rhythm residing within space like a cosmic pulsation just as the tides of the earth ebb and flow, so the tides of space are forever moving, and space is either outpouring or indrawing constantly. Space is like a breathing, the breath of Shiva. It breathes forth worlds by exhalation, and it draws them back into itself again by inhalation. Thus everything in space is either moving from the spatial energy or returning to it again, forming great arcs and resulting in a curved continuum, which ultimately ends in an infinite circle. These things, therefore, these beliefs, caused the ancient to assume that at certain times and under periodic conditions, space became objective. Space moved from its own pureness into the extension of itself, remained there for a time, and then flowed back again in what the ancient Indians called the days and nights of Brahma. And in the night of Brahma, the universe, space, cosmos slept. And in the day of Brahma, it came forth again into manifestation. And when it first came into manifestation, it burst forth as a radiant or glorious energy. And this glorious energy was immediately broken by space itself upon the spectrum of itself to form the great basic spectrum of seven colors, seven powers, seven gods, seven lights. So according to the ancients, when space becomes created, there comes forth from it seven foundations, Seven immense principles of principles, dependent upon principle. Seven magnificent energies of energies, dependent upon energy. These energies are conditions of energy. And the coming forth of the seven does not mean that space is seven times manifested. Rather that each of these manifestations is one-seventh of the potential of space so that when they blaze forth together to their own total fullness, they reveal space. And these seven became seven great suns. And these seven suns are totally invisible to the sight of man. They are seven great centers of cosmic life. And they are so vast and so inconceivable that their bodies, the bodies of these seven together, constitute all known and unknown space. They form a strange overlapping of circles and of uh, planes or levels. But these seven together extend beyond anything conceivable to man. For they have no actual boundaries except the boundaries of eternal space itself. These seven great suns in turn gave birth out of themselves to seven each one to seven more suns. And these in turn burst forth and broke apart 
radiate as radiated as seven more until this division took place six times and the universe was filled with these blazing suns and then came the seventh and with the bursting of this seventh came forth that race which we call in astronomy universal suns. In other words, we haven't even gotten down yet to the point where astronomy can conceive or take over the procedure. Because we are now dealing with the, with the gradual filling of the parts of space set aside for creation with this tremendous race of solar beings and that the extremity of the great process as we know it came forth the cosmic suns and these cosmic suns each had its throne in the great diffusion of space and each of these sovereign cosmic suns existed within the body of one of the greater orders which in turn dwelt within one still superior to itself until finally by retiring upward through this tremendous cycle of manifestation, man returned ultimately again to space itself. Now these universal suns, each with its own power, created its family, broke forth into its own manifestation as cosmic suns. And these cosmic suns in turn brought forth their progeny of lights, and these became the suns of solar systems. Thus our sun is one of these set by the ancients to be eight degrees removed from cause and to be therefore one of the lesser lights of the sky, one of the smaller parts, and the other great orders of suns and their cosmic systems and their universal chains and their great space organizations became symbolized to the ancients as the great field of constellations, for these constellations to the ancients were all alive. Everything in space was alive, there was no death. And these orders above us were simply races superior to our own, races of solar giants, each in turn part of some order greater than itself. Until finally out of all this mystery and diffusion came the simple mystery of our own solar world. Now these suns in space, cosmic, universal, and beyond, each had its own progeny and each produced its own kind of planets and these had their luminaries. And within the orders of all these great systems, creatures came into existence. Creatures whose even, even whose names we know nothing about, but who were the citizens of vast orders infinitely greater than our own. Some of these orders were so great that our entire solar system would not be as large as one of the simple organisms evolving within one of the still greater ones. All of these speculations came finally down uh, to man's concept of the solar deity. And the solar deity was therefore the direct focal point of all these other powers. And through the solar energy, all of the vast organism of chaos and cosmos uh, were released into the consciousness or integration that formed our way, our planet, our solar system. Thus, we have a kind of concept of space that is pretty big. One that uh, is almost too large for us to contemplate. And within all of this tremendous diffusion, everything is unfolding and evolving according to law. And this law is not something imposed from without, but something which is natural to the energies themselves, by means of which this diffusion is maintained. All of these processes obey their own natures. And as each thing obeys its own nature, it becomes the law for those things less than itself, or that exist within its own nature. Thus the total the purpose of a thing becomes the law of its parts. A man living within the mystery of the solar field, therefore, follows the laws of the sun, and follows the geometry and psychology and astronomy of the solar uh, world itself. 
Man contemplating these things from his own earthy position, looking up therefore into the sky and unable to contemplate the totality of this mystery by rationality, divided space into three stratifications, that is, a suitable to his own uh, comprehension. He recognized that there were more classifications, but they were simply beyond him. <clears throat> but he did see in space three apperceivable things, three qualities that he could, to a degree, comprehend. And the first of these great diffusions of the firmament he called the first motion, the primum mobile, the great motion of the world. And he declared that this motion this rhythm, this tremendous continuance of ever-flowingness represented to a great degree the life of God. But this life was a life forever in motion, both quantitative and qualitative motion, far more than anything we know. But he likened this motion to the tremendous motion of the heavens. He saw the heavens moving about the earth in a great, pageantry, an eternal processional, without beginning or end. Then the second division of the heavens, which he recognized, was a kind of psychic field, uh, which was located between the first motion and the firmament. And this psychic field was the seed ground of souls, for as all spiritual things had their life in the first motion, so souls had their life in the first formative processes of space. Souls were therefore the oldest of forms, inasmuch as they were all compounds, composed of a spiritual and a material factor. The third part of this great circle of the heavens, the third concentric layer of it, the one inward and nearest to man was called the firmament. And this firmament was a kind of wall built around space, a crystalline wall, enclosing within itself the mechanism of the solar system. Therefore, beyond the planets and their orbits were these three divisions of the sky going on and on and on. And in these divisions, were the abodes of the great creator gods. Always these gods dwelt in the heavens, in the firmament, because to the ancients the heavens represented the sphere of causes, the sphere of principles and energies, the invisible from which the visible came. And this invisible was a world of itself, a thing apart, populated by beings that were real but invisible. And to these were given various names, and where they were called the gods. Now the firmament, as because it enclosed the solar system, and therefore represented the uppermost parts of our physical uh, solar world, this uh, sphere was like a mountain, for it was above the earth, and it was far above the range of mortal mountains. And to the Indian philosophers, this mountain was Miru, the abode of the gods. To the later Shivites, it was Kalasa, the great mountain of Himabat. It was the Olympus of the Greeks. and the mysterious Jerusalem golden mountain of Christianity. It was a mountain because it was above, and men looked, lifted up their eyes unto the hills from whence cometh their help. So man, looking upward, did so not just quantitatively or physically, but in a symbolic sense, a looking toward the superior. And this superior for him was this strange sky that closed him in, as with a curtain of blue spangled with stars. In this uh, uh, process, therefore, we begin to see how the ancients devised their egg of the world, the strange shell of this egg being the firmament, and the 
beyond the firmament another world extending on and on. We get a very good picture of this concept in the revelation of St. John, also in Muhammad's night journey to heaven, and in the divine pymander of Hermes Trismegistus. Here we also find it in the descent of Estar through the seven gates of the descend into the underworld. Because this heaven abode was separated from the earth upon which man stood by the royal arches of Enoch, the royal arches of the sky, the arcs of the planets. And as man ascended through the orders and orbits of these planets, he came near to the Empyrean, or the great abode of the stars, uh, the firmament. And by inspiration, by inward illumination, this ascent lifted him ab above matter and into the abode of the gods. And this was represented by placing a small door in the sky through which St. John is said to have passed in his mystical reveries to examine the world that lay above. And here he found the sea of glass before which stood the throne of the eternal, hymned by the twenty-four elders, surrounded by the angels and symbols, and in the midst of it standing the Lamb with the seals of revelation. And in this great vision, then, uh, we had man moving into what he regarded as the causal universe. And below this causal universe, within the mysterious walls of the firmament, was a mythological universe, a universe of means, represented by planets, and finally a universe of ends, represented by elements. Thus the universe consisted of a cause moving through certain methods or means and finally flowing into receptivities or ends called material or substantial. Thus we find also in these ancient mythological concepts all life, as Plato points out, falls into generation through the Milky Way and from this Descending by the ladder of the planets comes ultimately into material embodiment. The Greeks had many legends and fables about these things. But I think uh, from the standpoint of astral theology, we have to assume that the ancients recognized uh, the twelve signs of the zodiac and the great northern and southern constellations, forming all together thirty-six major patterns in the sky, that the ancients represented these or recognized them as the channels through which the great universal energies beyond man's conception flowed down into the mystery of his solar system and into the mystery of his own corporeal life. Thus these constellations came to have certain meanings, uh, certain distinct and special attributes, and it was believed that as the ancient uh, Jewish people held that there were twelve tribes of Israel, Israel being an ancient generic term simply to signify the world, humanity, and kinds of life, that there were twelve orders of life that were nourished and fed by the energy which fell through the constellations of the zodiacal band, and that these twelve were further differentiated by the northern and southern constellations, until 36 forms or 36 emanational currents could be recognized. It was all heaven moving in upon man, supplying him constantly with energies. It was man's concept that when his material life was finished, he would return again to the sky from which he came. He must first, however, pass through a kind of purging in purgatory, or a place of darkness underneath the earth. He went down into the earth, but his spirit returned to the stars, and beyond the stars, into the mysterious heavenly world, uh, which was the magnificent uh, counterpart <coughs> of the lowly earth that we know. This forms a kind of study in anatomy, the anatomy of the universe. And in the researches that we carry on relating to these subjects, we become increasingly aware 
that all this fitted together to give us a great religious idea, a religious concept that was to remain and be restated in practically every faith of mankind. So let us try and examine for a little while uh, the development of the concept of the mysteries, as these mysteries depended upon the constellational diffusion. We told you something uh, last week about the precession of equinoxes and how uh, the uh, the great religions and faiths of the world were influenced by the sun's crossing over or the passing over of the, of the sun at the vernal equinox. This is part of our story, but there is very much more to it. So let us try and follow for a few minutes some of the symbolism that will help us in connection with this. We all know the labors of Hercules. We also know the partial story repeated of these labors in the story of Samson. We are aware of the story of the twelve adventures or voyages of Sinbad the sailor. All of these have to do with the same type of cosmological symbolism. This mysterious twelve returns again in the twelve prophets, the twelve patriarchs, and the judges that judged over Israel. They come back again in the jewels of the breastplate of the high priest, the loaves of the shoe bread. They come again in the circle of the twelve disciples, and in all of the different groups that we have. Wherever the astronomical symbolism and teaches its, and impresses itself upon religion, we find the revival if of then three we numbers of great importance. Of the world, twelve, Move seven, and around four. this great circle, which was always returning because they are the sun. great astronomical the numbers. Chinese philosophy. We see life proceeding in this way. We find also that in this pattern, a solar system such as ours must be part of a constellational diffusion. The ancients said that our sun is a small star in the tail of one of the fishes of Pisces. Therefore, that we belong to a being or a group of beings called blessed souls, and that we are therefore ourselves one of the twelve hierarchies. That the lords or powers of the twelve signs were referred to as hierarchs. The um, hierarchs, for example, of Capricorn were the archangels. The hierarchs of, Pis of Aquarius were the angels. And the hierarchs of Pisces are humanity. Humanity, therefore, is a divine being, a hierarchy. And this divine being is one of the twelve orders of life supported by the zodiac, as we find it, encircling the Empyrean. Now you might say that this zodiac encircles many suns and is made up of an infinite number of suns. So we come to a fine point that was rather carefully worked out by the ancients. This is true. Every star that forms part of the zodiacal mystery, and even those not directly within the band of the zodiac, belong in some mysterious way to these twelve hierarchs. But they are related to the Zodiac in different perspectives and in different relationships. Actually, we are in the constellation of Pisces, although we do not know it. Therefore, each of the stars within a certain constellation has a certain polarization. And another star within the constellation of Aquarius has a different polarization. And as a result of that, its relation to all the other signs is different. Consequently, actually, in this great family of planets and stars, there are no two alike. Each one is in a different relationship to all the others. And each one is passing through a great cycle of growth according to the laws governing its own constellational body. For this constellational body is a superior being within which a group of suns exist and have their being. All these divisions were charted and mapped for the ancients in order to give us some concept of the magnitude of the world in which we live. Man being of the sign of the fishes, the constellation of Pisces, 
becomes the dominant note in connection with him. And therefore, as this was the hierarch of the blessed souls, it indicates that within this constellation, regardless of the particular sun involved with its attendant planets, there is a certain kind of growth going on, a growth unique to this particular world, to this particular sphere of growth and development. This growth is the kind of growth that we call evolution. Uh, the fact that man and all creatures known to man must attain by a kind of growing distinguishes the hierarchy to which they belong. Man must therefore evolve, releasing from within himself by a sequence of patterns and laws the potentials locked within himself. Man is therefore placed in a world of self-improvement, a world of becoming, a world which was not known to the angels, a world that was never experienced by the archangels, because their orders of growth are different from our own. Their way of unfolding is entirely and totally dissimilar. We are therefore this strange world in which we must earn our bread with the sweat of our brow. We belong in a merit system that is peculiar to us. We belong also to a particular type of being which has within itself this great problem of ultimate assimilation. <clears throat> Pisces, or the sign of the fishes, is the end or the last sign of the great zodiacal band. Therefore, it is the sign which has to do with the gathering up of all other signs and all that has gone before. It is a sign that has to do with the fruition of previous labor. It is the sign which precedes the sleep or the rest of the gods. Therefore, it is the sign of the old and the end. It is the sign of things having reached destination, having completed arcs and cycles of purpose. And in this we find man living under the strange principle of retributional law, a law peculiar to his hierarchy, and a law which he must fulfill. Man, therefore, of all creatures, is most strongly and profoundly affected by these laws of karma, of destiny, because they belong to the constellation to which he is a part. And all life growing in that constellation grows by the laws he grows by. But a different group grows under an entirely different pattern of laws. Also man has another quality derived from this hierarchy, and that is the great compassional uh, factor, the great priesthood. For in a strange way, the sign of the fishes is the sign of priesthood. For it also has to do with that part of the solar system from which the new cycle is to be born. Therefore, that which goes to sleep at the end of humanity becomes the beginning of a new birth in time, a new organization, because it is the end of an old, the binding up of a cycle, the completion of things, the paying of debt, the compensation for all things unfinished. And finally, out of this total uh, completeness comes the engendering of a new order of life, a new way of life. So that in a wonderful way, this sign represents uh, the way of spiritual rebirth into another sphere or another plane of action. The ancients had all these keywords and all these keys and codes by means of which they identified the activities and powers of the different constellational groups. And each star had its way of life, and each constellation had its laws and its governors, and the principles by which it was eternally modified or eternally advanced in its own destiny. This brings us to another concept in ancient astronomical symbolism, namely that space is full of mind, uh, that all of these great sovereign bodies are mental entities as well 
as spiritual beings. They are mental energies because the ancients were convinced that the suns were alive, that they were not merely masses of energy, but they were the bodies of blessed gods. And we find this so beautifully told to us in the Emperor Julian's oration to the Sovereign Sun. These suns, these great centers of life everywhere in space, were conscious, rational beings. It was only in comparatively recent times that man came into the conviction that he lived in a world in which he was conscious and other things were unconscious. The ancient man believed that he possessed a minimum of consciousness and that these greater beings around him were far more conscious and far more luminous and far more aware than himself. Man could not understand these beings, but they could understand him. Therefore, the great central suns were centers of understanding, and therefore of benevolence. And each sun was a being with a spiritual integrity, a rational power of penetration and judgment, and an active principle of generation. These powers operating together meant that these great beings were actually creatures, tremendous, inconceivable creatures, yet at the same time, like all creatures, possessing sentient powers, possessing a kind of self-knowledge and a knowledge of other things, as man possesses these faculties to a more limited degree. Thus there was a sidereal population of rational gods, of great beings, ch children of the great and superior one from which they all came. And these, like the elders of Revelation, bowed down in adoration before the throne, the great blazing mystery of the invisible sun, which was at the root of life. Thus everything was astronomical. Everything had to do with the setting up of formal thrones by means of which the wonders of nature could be made manifest. Now the opposite extremity of this vast pageantry was what we call Earth. And Earth was a very strange thing also. Because Earth was not, as we consider it, something substantial beneath our feet, the ancients were well aware that Earth as an element was floating in the midst of a diffusion of life, that earth was a little island upon the surface of the sea of life, that earth and all other earthy things were conditions, not essentially places nor times, but kinds of life. And earth was to them a privation of active principles. Earth was the negative pole of heaven. Earth was the infinite receptor into which all things of a dynamic were forever flowing. Earth was like a vessel that captured life into itself. Man's body was of earth. Therefore it was likewise a vessel which contained and captured within itself the life of heaven. All earthy things were therefore shadows, symbols, negative extensions of life not absolutely deficient in life, but deprived of it in some way or part. Thus what we like to think of as matter was merely a temporary condition in this great mystery of life itself. But the ancient also had the realization that this matter, which was the source of body, which was the source of this strange prison world in which man finds himself, that this matter as a polarization was absolutely essential to the kind of life that man has to live. Ancient man differed from modern man in another particular. The ancient man had a wonderful acceptance. Ancient man never questioned the validity or the rightness of things. He accepted that which the gods bestowed. It was his power and privilege to obey, uh, to fulfill, not to doubt. So it never occurred to him in his older days that the earth was bad 
or that matter had any bearing upon materialism. He never conceived of materialism as we know it, where materialism is simply a kind of worshipping of matter, whereas ancient man worshipped light and the sun and space and the gods. But if we have become a little inclined to develop a matter fixation, it is simply because in our way of life, matter is the only thing that we can see, and only things composed of some kind of matter or containing material elements are visible to us. Pure life, pure intelligence, pure love are not visible to us except when we clothe them in some material symbol by which they become recognizable, either through their attributes or through their propensities. But matter itself, which is body, the beginning of all bodily condition, is a receptacle which receives into itself the life and light of heaven as into another kind of earth. And from this earth, the light bursts forth again through the seed and all things grow upward from matter towards the life which is their common source. So we have elements. Elements not only in our earth, but elements throughout space. For space everywhere is polarized. And wherever in space there is this matter pole existing, it is part of matter. Therefore matter has nothing to do with our solar system primarily, or our earth primarily. It is a condition a condition that exists wherever life moves out into activity because it represents the receptivity which must receive that activity. And without polarization, life cannot manifest itself. And the moment it is polarized, it becomes life and matter. So matter is the infinite challenge, that which must ultimately be filled with life, and must ultimately again return to life. Now matter produces out of its own mysteries bodies, and bodies themselves cannot exist merely out of matter. Matter is the substance, but there must always be the sculptor. Matter is the clay for the pot, but there must always be a potter to mold the clay. So matter extends on and on through space, visible and invisible, actually, for its subtler parts still transcend our perceptions. But matter goes on and on and on. It is a tremendous material from which we can build almost anything, but it remains simply a great expanse of potential. In order that this matter shall become activated, shall have the power to produce out of itself something, or to be molded or made into something, there must arise between space and matter an intermediate power. And this intermediate power the ancient called mind. And mind was the beginning of the principle of form. For mind is the power which molding matter organizes it into forms. Therefore, wherever mind operates upon matter, there is form. And both mind and matter disappear in the form. And there is a new compound or a new substance that seems to appear. And this new substance is a species or a kind of life. For minerals, plants, animals, men, supermen, deities are compounds of mind and matter. And wherever these compounds arise, we have the emergence of tangible, growing, unfolding forms of life. The molding of matter by mind makes many wonders possible to us. So the ancients interposed between the firmament of the fixed stars, the great spiritual agency, and the elements of, of the earth, earth, fire, air, and water, the primordial elements which they knew. Between these two, they place the mysterious septenarial hierarchy of mind. And they form this mind out of the mystery of the seven planets. And this mind became, by its original power, the thinker. By its reactional power, the reflector. 
And therefore, by the will of mind, by the creative action of mind, things are generated and formed. But by the reflective power of mind, things are regenerated and reformed. And when mind reaches the point in its development, in which it moves from generation to, we might say, regeneration, when it passes from the conquest of matter uh, to the re, uh, revelation of itself through matter, it then moves into a level which we call psyche. And the soul is the regenerating, redeeming, transmuting power which arises from the reflective attributes of mind. So the angels had their seven planets which formed the rational focus these seven planets gradually developed into the seven powers of the human mind, represented and throned in the seven parts of the brain, even as the seven powers of the spirit are located in the septenarial division of the heart. The mind, therefore, with its seven powers, became a second kind of creator, known as the Demiurgus or the God who creates formal things. And the ancients recognized this power as the second Logos, or that which takes hold of the primary elements of space and fills them with a race of titans or of giants who become the molders of space, who become the gradual formators of the world that we know. These were the Ammonian artificers who gouged out holes in space in Egypt in philosophy and made them into worlds. So mind becomes sort of the master of matter. It becomes the skillful artisan, the tubal cane, the worker with fires. It becomes the power of ornamenting and glorifying. It is the builder, which causes to be built out of matter this mysterious, symbolical form of the everlasting house of Solomon the king. So it is mind that organizes matter and builds it into a great palace, into a great temple in which the God of ages is to be enshrined, is to find his material sanctuary among men. This power of mind is variously represented in ancient philosophy, but I think that we consider uh, in most cases, that this power of mind is particularly centered in the egoism of man. It is this power of mind by which man ultimately discovered his own identity, his own self-existence. And by establishing his own self-existence, he made the discovery that he was somewhere between heaven and earth. He had outgrown the earth, but he had not yet reached heaven. And he conceived, therefore, of a ladder uniting heaven and earth, the same ladder or the type of ladder that we find in the story of Jacob and his dream. This ladder was one upon which living beings ascend and descend. This ladder was the orbits of the seven planets that extended upward from the surface of the earth to the inner surface of the firmament or the empyrean. And these uh, seven orbits were the abodes of seven cosmocrators, or deities of creation. <coughs> they were the ones who molded matter. They were the tyrants, the gods of old. They were the jealous gods of ancient nations, nations and races. They were the ones that, moving about the earth, sought and accomplished the organization of the earth. Among them, according to the Olympian hierarchy, the parts of the world were divided and distributed. They were given their kingdoms, their temples, their sanctuaries. From them, the ancient Hindus say, came forth the continents and the races and the nations, each under the rulership of its own particular deity. But these deities in themselves simply represent the specializations of the seven powers of the mind, moving relentlessly but magnificently, ultimately, to the, become the seven powers of the soul. 
Now this transformation of these seven as first appearing, focusing their energies upon matter to produce creation, and finally becoming seven doors through which creation escapes back into a spiritual state. This strange difference, the descending and ascending powers of these planetary uh, arcs or arches are represented through the involutionary and evolutionary motions of energy. So in the initiation rites of ancient man, we find this set forth in such symbolism as the hymn of the robe of glory. We see man as a spirit, man as a divine being, a part of God. We find him descending in some systems voluntarily and in others involuntarily. But always that he is descending through the seven orbits of the planets as he descended through the royal arches of Enoch to come finally to the earth and there to go to sleep in matter and there to remain asleep for a certain time and finally to awaken from this sleep as an infant to pass through the seven ages which constitute physical life and the seven stages which represent the seven degrees of spiritual evolution. We find, therefore, that these levels or stages or degrees are related to the seven churches which are in Asia, and the seven golden rungs of the ladder that fell from heaven so that Muhammad could ascend through the gates of the Empyrean. Man, then, has this sevenfold mystery within himself. He is ascending through seven sta stages of consciousness, and he is returning gradually to the empyrean or to the heavenly state from which he came. He ascends through his own growth, through his own disciplines, and through the perfections of arts and sciences, for every labor that he performs is part of the septenary. Every degree of growth which he attains is part of it. His evolution through races, his evolution through religions, cultures, through great epics in history, all these turn back upon the septenary, and all parts can be measured and determined by the seven levels of the soul by which it ascends to a, the light from which it came. These are the seven souls of the ancient Gnostic doctrine and of the Egyptian teaching about immortality. So we have man as a creature passing through an initiation ritual. He descends through the seven orbits, becomes locked in the abode of darkness, and then from darkness he reemerges. And in your doctrine of Neoplatonism, you find the seven steps of a consciousness ascending from opinion through sense to knowledge and finally upward to illumination, which is again the perfection of the psychic life in man. Incidentally, and by all these points, it is curious that in the evolutionary process, it is not the personal life of man, but the psychic life which must be saved. It is not the individuality, but the universality in man which is important. And this, this must be brought ultimately and finally to its total liberation. So we have these orders of ancient planets. And we go back to our Greek system, and we find several things that are of great interest to us. In the Greek theology, for example, we find that originally the great God was called heaven. And this God was called uh, the, the great father God, and he was Uranus, the sky deity. And this sky deity... Uh, rule supreme for a great period of time. And then his kingdom was taken from him by Saturn. And Saturn in turn lost his kingdom to Zeus. And Zeus, in order to save his kingdom and to make possible its ultimate regeneration, fashioned in a mystery and carried in a golden thigh bone the mysterious infant child Zagreus, or Dionysus, who was to be 
the radiant personification of the God himself. This deity, Dionysus, was for the salvation of the world. Now let us see what this all means when we, we start to develop it. We see then that heaven, Uranus, losing its kingdom to Saturn, is the beginning of generation. This means the first orbit within the great mystery of the sky itself. Saturn was the ancient one, the old god, Cronus, and for some mysterious reason the ancient named the outer orbit of the solar system in honor of this deity, placed the symbol of Saturn as the sign of the ancient one, Cronus, or time, and made this god the devourer of his own children. And Saturn, in order to preserve his kingdom, destroyed his children by eating them as rapidly as they were born. But finally, the wife of Saturn substituted a stone for one of the children, and this deceiving the god, Zeus was permitted to live, and Zeus in due time took over the kingdom of his father and fulfilled the ancient prophecy that was written in space. The legend here is rather obvious. Saturn is time. Time devours its own children. It devours everything which is engendered within it. Nothing that is born in time or of time can survive time. Therefore, we have here a problem in substitution. By a subterfuge, something that was timeless was introduced into the pattern of time. And in this way, uh, Saturn was outwitted to produce out of itself or from itself the deity Zeus or Jupiter. Now let us go for a moment and remember that our ancients were not concerned with mere physical phenomena. What did Saturn represent? Saturn represented to the ancients supreme wisdom. <clears throat> Saturn was the ancient power that must ultimately also devour everything less than itself. Therefore, all things that, be, that are born from wisdom must ultimately be devoured again by wisdom. This was the strange, abstract, contemplative wisdom of meditation. This was meditation from which things are born, but to which all things must return again. This was a kind of consciousness which engenders, but holding and possessing always forces the thing which it has created to return to itself again and be dissolved. So Saturn, representing the beginning of creation, also becomes the symbol of death. <coughs> For everything that is created must die. And everything that is born of the race of the Volsung in the Nordic mysteries is destined to the tragedy of the Gotadamaru. All the heroes of the world must die because they are the progeny of death. So anciently Saturn, or Cronus, was represented carrying the scythe of death, sometimes represented as the reaper, and often as an aged person, often as a skeleton. Saturn was then the devourer the ultimate. Saturn was the beginning of motions which in themselves must end. Saturn was the beginning of separation which is itself the supreme illusion and must lead ultimately uh, to the end of its own existence. So Saturn plays many parts, often apparently in complete con conflict with themselves, but always there is one underlying principle underneath. And that principle is that Saturn is strangely both beginning and end. Saturn is the hope and the end of hope. Saturn is death and Saturn is everlasting life, depending upon the direction of the motions. For the ancients believed that from the rings of Saturn, souls were cast back into the empyrean or space. Saturn is the graveyard of all things. But it is destined, according to the Chinese, that all the earth shall someday be a graveyard. 
Everything that is mortal comes under the power of this Saturnian principle that is the absolute tyrant. And yet by another mystery, one child escaped the destruction. One child could not be devoured by the god. And what was the symbol of this child? Why did Zeus survive? This is a very interesting and knotty problem in Greek philosophy and Greek metaphysics. But it seems that Saturn gave birth out of himself to one principle that could defeat himself. And the nature of this principle we have to find in the very processes of contemplation. For in the meditational mystery, there is in the state of illumination that power which can escape death, the power that is born of death but comes to eternal life. There is in the composition of all things that which is born but cannot die. This mystery is the mystery of the soul itself. For the soul is the only thing that has a beginning in time, but an eternity of continuance. So it was the Greek concept, inasmuch as the soul, outgrowing the mystery of life, was alone capable of the experience of immortality. <coughs> Zeus survived the strategy to destroy him, and in time became the master of the kingdom. Now Zeus at this stage represents the infantile aspect of the soul. The soul in its, uh, we will say, in its potential, not in its potency. And Zeus becomes a kind of autocrat. Zeus becomes a very tyrannical thing. Because he is the symbol of imagination, and because he has to do with the dream of creation. And from Zeus, in his dreaming and in his mystery, there come forth certain principles and powers. And one of these principles or powers is the horn Zagros, which is carried within his father's thigh, the mother Semele having been destroyed by thunderbolts. And this horned deity is Mars. Now Mars therefore, is the next in our order of descending planetary orbits from the sun, from the uh, sphere of Saturn. And Zagros, in turn, is Mars, or the dynamic energy of the Titans, or the titanic powers which force the world into existence. And the power of Mars is the power of will. Therefore, out of the experience out of the mystery of imagination, out of the creative potency of, of Zeus, comes the symbol of will. Will as the directing force by means of which worlds are brought into manifestation and by which the objective life of man is maintained. But this Zagros passes through a metamorphosis because will in itself is a very subtle thing, as Schopenhauer points out. And out of the mystery of will comes the alternati alternative deity. For from Zagros comes forth Dionysus. And this uh, change is accomplished without death or without the changing of personality. Zagros simply becomes Dionysus. And the uh, means of this becoming is a metamorphosis so gradual and so systematic that it is almost impossible to determine the boundaries of the myth. Dionysus, of course, is the sun. So we find the solar system moving from the power of Mars to the power of the sun. Now the sun, therefore, becomes a kind of regeneration or redirection of the power of will. And out of will, the will of the creating factor of Zeus, the will born of heaven, comes this other kind of will, which Bermi terms the divine will. The will of man, the will of nature, the will of the universe, 
uh, to the achievement of the great spiritual mystery, the regeneration of will, the transformation of will from the force aspect uh, to the compassion aspect, so that the great power to create things, to force things, to move things, is transformed from will to love. And love becomes a supreme power taking the place of will. And in this, Zeus gives his beloved son, <coughs> transforming him from the will aspect to the love aspect. And as soon as this is achieved, Dionysus begins his great adventure which leads to his final tragedy. For it is the inevitable tragedy of love that it must perish. And love, strangely enough, dies for its world, or dies into its world. And in the mystery of Dionysus and his adventures, we have the focal point of the human ego. Dionysus becomes also the human spiritual entity, born of will and perfected in love. A creature created by a fiat of power, but perfected by a renunciation of power. So Zagros and Dionysus become the polarities of will as power and love as redeeming power. Thus we have descended now through the four arches of the sky, the orbits of the planets Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, and the Sun. And we find the sun placed midway in the septenary. This makes it possible for the sun to be the fourth from below and the fourth from above, constituting a point of mingling. The sun's location, then, corresponds almost exactly with the location of the heart and the human body suspended between the two great focal points of creation and generation and also the middle ground of the soul or psychic field. And the sun, or the ego, standing in the midst of itself, standing in the middle part of the great septenary of the soul sphere, has the right and has the power to extend its rays upward to the contemplations of causes, or to descend with its rays into the underworld to become involved in the mystery of effects. If the sun falls into the underworld, it is there for three degrees, or three days, buried. For it descends through the orbits of the three inferior planets, and is finally placed within the earth, which is the underworld. And in turning further downward, this new power, this power which we call the compassion or love of God, falls next into its reflection or negative correspondent, becoming involved in the mystery of Venus, which is like the Venusberg and Tannhäuser or Kundry and the Parseval cycle. For as the sun, blessed of its father and bearing its father's power of divine love, representing the eagle, falls into the orbit of Venus, it falls into sensory or sensuous love. It falls into the personal out of the impersonal, for it is descending downward, now into the mystery of illusion. And Venus is the guardian of the garden of illusion. And Venus represents the appetitive and emotional powers of the soul. Captured within these powers, Held like possible in an enchanted garden, uh, the soul begins to substitute human emotion for divine emotion. Substitutes attachment to form for attachment to life. Substitutes the beautification of externals for the glorification of eternals. And so the great psychic entity falls into the orbit or sphere of Venus who is the mistress of the oceans, born out of the sea, born out of Maya or the dream. This uh, mysterious descent, according to the Greeks, 
was represented in their mystery rituals by a series of sensory temptations, which unless the candidate could overcome them or withstand them, meant that he was led astray into the mystery of darkness. From this orbit, the psychic nature falling into generation, and now uh, we will say clothed with the emotional power of Venus, therefore with sensory appetite and emotion, falls then into the orbit of Mercury. And in the orbit of Mercury, another factor takes over. For Mercury is the symbol of the a critical intellect. This Mercury is the symbol of sensory perception deriving its authority through the five senses. Thus the objective sensory perceptions of man are represented by Mercury. They are the senses which are the messengers of the gods. They carry the sensory reflexes from the external world to man and from man outward to the external world. But by now he is captured in the illusion. Therefore now, not only does the emotional nature tyrannize him, but also the intellective principle, in its negative polarity, Mercury, begins to burden him with opinion, divides him, creates criticism, sets him upon a division of learning, of attitudes, in which little by little the unities of knowledge are lost, so that Mercury makes him the critic rather than the knower. It makes him the intellectual rather than the wise person. And having become invested and involved, therefore, with the powers of the sensory illusions, the generating or incarnating soul falls into the orbit of the moon, which is the last before uh, the actual uh, embodiment or the final descent into matter. The orbit of the moon is the orbit of imagination. Imagination supported and sustained by sensory perception and the amatory principle of Venus closes in upon the individual, limiting the soul more and more to a kind of life that emerges only from within itself or as the ancient Greeks said, placing man totally under the tyranny of his own interpretation of things. For imagination creates the world we live in. We do not live in a world as it is, we live in a world as it seems to us. Every neurosis, every bitterness, every defeat in our own nature colors our concept of the whole world. And as our own disillusionments increase, as our own vitality decreases, the world closes in upon us as a terrible or hateful thing. Imagination gives us false motivations, lim limits us and binds us constantly with the effects of our own inward imageries, drawing upon uh, the darkening resources of our inner lives. In our slow descent, we come finally into the amazing and incredible condition that we no longer even are capable of seeing the world as it is, knowing the world even with the aid of the sensory perceptions, because everything that we see is instantly interpreted. Everything that we contact is distorted and deformed by our own imaging about it. And so we finally land in a kind of personal universe in which each individual creates his own world in spite of the world he lives in, and instead of being a citizen of the earth, he becomes only a partisan, a partisan within his own tiny world, the world perhaps of himself alone, or of his family, or of a few limited ties. He loses complete sight of even the facts of the world around him, creating an imaginary series of facts that are valid only to himself. Facts which are constantly subject to change because they are not real, because they have no foundation in abiding truth. And according to the Greeks, when this uh, descending being reaches this point, it is coming very near and dangerously close to the final involvement. For the material world which we call the earth, 
is surrounded by a kind of humid atmosphere. Thales was one who developed quite a philosophy of this humid atmosphere. But having reached downward now uh, to the orbit of the moon, the soul is swept down into the humidity of the earth. And this humidity closes in upon it as water upon a drowning man. And once, as Heraclitus points out, that this humidity captures the descending being, it intoxicates it. And the peculiar fetid aroma of death, which is on the earth, the strange world earth which is made of the rotting of things, as the ancients said, that as life crawled out of prehistoric slime and mud and the elos of the primordial sphere, so that the so the earth itself is a strange kind of humid atmosphere, like that in a hot house, where we have the smell of the earth and the strange steaminess of it. And the ancients said that this was a kind of atmosphere which, when the soul becomes immersed in it, acts like an intoxicating liquor. The soul becomes drunk or intoxicated, as we find in the myth of Cupid and Psyche, where Psyche, having uh, been immersed in matter, can no longer walk straightly, but walks with a strange twisting motion, staggering about. This staggering of the soul in the humidity of the earth was said to lead it finally to the point where it drank the waters of Lethe and passed into total unconsciousness concerning its own nature or its own substance. And in this unconsciousness it is born, born into this world as a physical being, born unconscious. Not only born unconscious, but doomed to remain unconscious. Not only through the childhood and infancy, but into maturity and old age. Because consciousness, truly, must have escaped in some way from this humidity of earth. And if it does not escape, it is never able to express itself. Thus man, even in his maturity, carrying on the projects of his living, advances by staggering, advances in a strange circuitous route, advances like the crab, making one step forward and two sideways, never straight, because the soul is intoxicated by matter and it wanders about, unable to extricate itself from the fumes and from the strange purgatorial mists that rise from the earth. Of course, this is the symbolic story as told in the mysteries, but the point of it is rather obvious, that the being once enveloped and enmeshed in the substance of body is locked within it, and being thus locked within it struggles desperately to escape but cannot find any way out of body. This was the beginning and end, essentially, of the doctrine of Socrates, was that man must discover a means of rescuing his own being from the strange humidity which we call ignorance. Ignorance being the strange property which intoxicates the soul when it enters into the sublunary sphere which we call the earth. So having brought the soul now downward in the mystery ritual, down the rungs of the ladder, we find man completely locked, yet with all this locking, bearing within himself all the powers of the hierarchs from which he has fallen, also containing the mystery of the orbits of the planets through which he has descended. He has by been locked for the seven deadly sins, or the negative poles of these planets. He must now unlock them by developing the seven cardinal virtues of the soul. He must ascend once more through the seven churches which are in Asia, and he must open the seven seals of Revelation, and he must learn to understand the Vedantic mystery of the opening of the seven chakras, or symbols of soul release, by which man ascends again, into the abode from which he came. To make this ascent possible, 
the ancients say that institutions were set up in the world. And these institutions were in every case, in some manner, reminiscent of the universe. The temples of the ancient gods were built in the forms of constellations and of worlds. And the great forms that were used throughout were either the forms of man himself, representing in his structure, as Leonardo da Vinci points out, the measurements of the cosmos, or the great canon of rules by which the merits and values of all things may be estimated. Man himself, contemplating the productions of nature and the productions of art, uh, is stimulated, according to the Greeks, by the dawn of memory. In other words, he must first of all activate the lower faculties of his own consciousness. From the moon he gained imagination. Imagination, by its abuse or misuse, cast him into matter, causing him to look downward, see his own reflection in the pool, and like Narcissus, perish trying to embrace the likeness of himself. But man ascending must ascend back through these orbits by transmuting each of the energies and making the destroying powers the redeemers. He is able to do this because within himself was placed the blood of Dionysus. He contains within himself the life of the solar mystery. And because he possesses this, he is potentially capable of overwhelming or overcoming the creatures that guard each sphere all the way back to the world from which he came. Man is greater than the angel. Man can escape because by nature, origin, and substance, he is superior to the thing in which he is captured. If man had been created in or differentiated from any one of those seven levels, he could not ascend above it. But because he was created above them all, he can be restored uh, to his own natural destiny. Because he was enslaved rather than created, he can be liberated rather than annihilated. <clears throat> Thus that which is within him, being superior to the world, cannot die with it, but can be rescued or separated from death by the mystery of the ascent of the ladder of the seven stars, the jewel of the seven stars of Egypt, the mysterious ladder rising from the tomb of the Egyptian priest, upon which, on the rounds of which, ascends the binu, or bird of the soul. The man's locked within matter, finding locked also within himself the seven lights of the candlestick, and the seven mysterious angels before the throne. He discovers that within him are the seven powers which imprisoned him, and each one of these powers, through cultivation, becomes a liberator. Therefore, man, to redeem himself, must redeem the seven powers of the planets. Thus, in the ancient alchemical mystery, the philosopher's stone was composed of the substance of the seven planetary metals, which, when properly brought together, or purified, or redeemed by rotations, as they were called, would ultimately produce the elixir of life, the philosopher's stone, and the universal medicine. So had coming back up, man discovers that imagination is to be now his leader. He must redeem imagination. And this redemption of imagination is perhaps one of the labors upon which man has worked from the earliest periods of history. He has been trying to use this strange formative power within him to ennoble rather than to destroy. He has sought to escape the pit that we are in today and make out of this neurotic instinct the great creative agent, the magical agent of liberation, as Paracelsus described it. For imagination is the thing that makes it possible for man to dream that he is better than he is.
dream that he is able to achieve. For everything we have fashioned and created in this world was first in the imagination of man. And then by building a foundation under dreams, he advanced the common cause of his kind. So the purification and redemption of imagination causes man to first imagine and then comprehend the magnificent integrity and order of the universe. He sees himself as a god. He sees himself as a divine creature and is moved by this vision to become like that which he desires to be. So out of imagination then comes uh, what the ancients would have definitely called a certain sensory organization. And on the level of this sensory organization, we probably can place the whole structure of science. For here, with the mind's lower faculties under the rule of Mercury, man begins the integration of his world. He begins these projects of the mind which seem important to him, but which in the universe are probably totally unimportant. They are important only for what they can do for man and not for what they can do for the universe. But gradually, science organizes sense perception. It takes the sensory perception away from the superficial and the obvious, organizes it, tests it, tries it, disciplines it, until finally man develops what we may term a scientific method, an orderly procedure for the cultivation of those things which he has imagined, and what points of dream scientists have caused to come about. And having therefore organized, integrated, and made methodical the faculties of sense perception, man can now use them for liberation rather than for bondage. Instead of being drowned by the senses, he makes use of them to open doors into larger worlds and to carry him forward to a still greater achievement. And in this achievement and in all these problems, he runs against an obstacle. For sense and imagination both run against the obstacle of ambition. And ambition is a powerful passion. Ambition is one of the powerful emotions associated with the negative pole of Venus. It is not ambition just to be great. It is this ambition which is the true passion of the soul by which it is driven. And this driving of the soul by emotion leads it first to disaster and finally to redemption. For it is the redeeming regeneration of the emotions by means of which man slowly emerges into a world of friendship instead of a world of fear. It is by the redemption of emotion that man becomes capable of being a friend, capable of a pure affection for life, for beings, for persons, for conditions, capable of a humanitarianism which places the common good above individual good and causes love of self to be finally dissipated by love of good. And so by degrees man takes love which once bound him to his own ego and uses it to release his skill, giving benevolence to knowledge, uh, giving depth to uh, illusion or sensation. So finally, these factors all contribute to the elevation of man and the ultimate improvement of the total structure of human society. Man then returns once more to the level of the Dionysian estate, which is the orbit of the sun. And here man finally exhausts those things for which the sun stands. For the sun not only represents the source of life energy, but because it is a center of light in a field of light, it represents the primary factor of individuality. Individuality is the root of egoism. <clears throat> Individuality is the power of the individual to see himself, know himself, and determine for himself. So this individuality, which was once a passion to be separate, 
gradually leads upward in its redeeming course until it reaches itself and uh, comes back again to the level of ego existence in the concept of the perfect human being. The individual who has carried self as far as self can go and having so achieved and having brought self to its human destiny, the individual must go on beyond self. Man having achieved the orbit of the sun, according to the ancient rites, had attained his potential humanity. He had transformed this potential into a potency. He was a human being. Until he has made this ascent and achieved this end, he is not truly human. Therefore, he must attain his humanity by passing through the cycles of the mysteries. The lesser mysteries being of those planets which are below the orbit of the sun in the ancient system. Having attained, therefore, to the substance of his own existence, man is instinctively and immediately moved by another consideration. The moment we become fully aware of self, truly aware, we must become aware of the relation of self to other things. A man having attained to selfhood discovers that it is not the end, that it is not sufficient that man should be alone. It is not good for man to be alone. It is not good for the individual to simply be himself, even though that self may be a rich and luminous experience. The man continues to expand upward into the heroic state of the Greeks. And in the heroic state, he comes again into the influence of Mars, now upon the ascending order. For of the order of heroes are such as Achilles, a mighty warrior, Odysseus, a strong and brave man, Hercules, slayer of the Nubian lion, and many other wonderful and uh, magnificent adventures. Mars, therefore, now represents a new kind of energy introduced. And it is this kind of energy which causes the individual to ascend to the heroic state. That which was the martial principle of aggressiveness now takes the form of man's dynamic determination to overcome the egoism in himself. He becomes the armored warrior, like St. George of Cappadocia, the warrior who must slay the dragon of his own ego. He becomes, therefore, the overcomer of beasts. He becomes the cleanser of stables. He becomes capable of capturing the girdle of the Amazons. One step by step, he achieves the heroic state, the hero represented by the man of spiritual action. Now, the man of spiritual action is the one is who, in whom this action is both dynamic and internal. It is the action which is great enough and strong enough to break the tie of the ego. And so, uh, like the mysterious story of Alexander, the hero cuts the Gordian knot and in that, way, in that way escapes the confusion which binds and holds the ordinary mortal. The heroic state, then, is the state of the redeemed Mars, for it makes the hero of the world. It makes the conqueror who conquers not with the sword, but with the light of truth. It is the individual who has the supreme heroic power to conquer self and to take the sword of swift detachment and cut low the mystery of illusion. It is consequently this strange conflict of Siegfried the dragon slayer. It is the hero self now as the armed and plumed warrior who turns upon illusion and with the pure power of the heroic consciousness overcomes it. 
In the Greek legend, therefore, those who thus overcome and thereby achieve the reversal of the curse placed by Zagros in the descending order, these who then ascend are reunited to the Demiurgus, Zeus, entering into the Jupiterian state. And the Jupiterian state in the ancient Greek system or symbol was the state of true or universal mind. Here the individual begins to take upon his own consciousness the mind which is above ego. This is the higher monastic mind of India, the mind uh, that transcends thinking as we know it, so that it becomes what the ancients call the legislative mind, the mind that begins to seek for and gain identity with the law. Thus the mind on the level of Zeus is mind consciously identified with universal law, for it is by law that Zeus brought forth the world, and it is by law that man folds up the world again and puts it away. It is this power in himself by which he is able to penetrate the world and to achieve identity with the laws that govern it, and in so doing to attain the, uh, the deific state of the higher Eleusinian rites. Thus, this is the law, this is the type of mind that is the pure reflective mind, the mind which in the descending arc, objectified to create the world, and on the ascending arc, subjectifies to experience the power above the world. Thus it becomes the abstract or creative aspect of mind. And having thus accomplished its destiny as mind, it returns to the father whom it first outwitted, and that is Saturn. And it stands upon the uh, edge of the mysterious world over which Saturn governs. And man, as a being, comes finally into conflict with the ultimate adversary, time. It come, he comes into contact with the ultimate thing that says to him, You must either be created and die or you must escape creation if you would live. You can rationalize reason and create with the mind, but still you will die. The mind will grow tired, the mind will grow weary, and there will be gods that will take away your kingdom, no matter how wise you are. As the wise Greek once said to Croesus, the richest of kings, who said, I have more gold than anyone in the world. And the stranger said, yes, your majesty, but a man with better iron will take it all. And no matter how far we go, according to the Greek cosmological concept, we come finally to the arch, arch of Saturn, where the keeper of time and eternity awaits us. Man, to elude Saturn, or to evade, or to fulfill, or to pass through this mystery, to escape from it in some directional manner, must therefore face the mystery of death, the mystery of time, the mystery of existence. For all of these things hang like pendants upon Saturn's slender and emaciated structure. So man finds that he approaches Saturn, that the reaper is there to gather all that belongs to itself. And as Saturn is the father of generations, and is the one from whom all the seven mysteries of existence are suspended, Saturn can claim them all, take them back one by one. And only that which can survive the loss of the seven parts of the personality can survive. So the aspirant 
the dreamer after the mysteries, then comes to the realization that the only way he can save his life is to lose it. That the only way that he can gain everlastingness is to free himself totally and completely from the illusion of existence. This would be equivalent to the Buddhist nirvana. This is equivalent to the absolute samadhi of the higher Vedanta. Actual consciousness on the Mahaparanavanic plane. So here the being has to make the great decision of the total renunciation of all the things that Saturn can claim. And Saturn can claim everything that belongs to us, including ourselves. But the thing that Saturn cannot claim is that which belongs to Uranus, the lord of the sky. For Saturn is the son of Uranus, and he cannot claim the father's part. So the only thing that man can take away beyond the orbit of Saturn is the mystery of heaven itself. And in the Eastern tradition, this means that at the gates or on the mysterious rings of Saturn, all forms, physical, mental, psychological, must be dissipated and cast back into the great reservoir of substances from which worlds are fashioned. The only thing that can go on is pure heaven, which means the pure, unconditioned consciousness of man. This consciousness then returns to the great father of all, and from the great father, Uranus, it is restored in due time to the mystery of the constellations, and it comes into another life above the firmament, a life which, as Buddha points out, because it is positive, whereas all our life, all our living is negative, is unknowable to us, because what we call wisdom is only a degree of ignorance. What we call happiness is the least degree of misery. What we call security is the least degree of insecurity. The positive facts of all of these things elude us, because they are all captured within the cycles of illusion, which constitute the seven mysteries of the soul. Man, however, as a pure consciousness being, comes to Uranus. And in your astrological mystery, Uranus is the will of heaven, the divine will. The absolute authority of the universal energy consciousness itself. So man, escaping finally through the mystery of the arches and the arcs, comes to the eighth above sphere, which is the sphere of heaven. And here, as the golden verse of Pythagoras tells us, he becomes a blessed god no longer susceptible of death. This is how your astronomy was made to become the instrument of a theology, which has been scattered throughout the universe as we know it, throughout ours at least, and by means of which we have a skeletal form in practically every system of philosophy and ethics that we know. This mysterious descent and ascent of the ladder which unites heaven and earth as a series of moral qualities. And as our time permits, we will go into it a little further, but I guess that's about all we can do now.